I hope nobody minds, but I'm going to stand out here this evening. You can go ahead and turn in your Bibles to the book of Psalm, Psalms uh, 119. We're going to begin reading here in just a moment, right around verse 49. Psalm 119, right around verse uh, 49. This morning we talked a little bit uh, in our Sunday morning service about being balanced. It's important that we understand the concept of being balanced because, quite frankly, we live in an unbalanced world. Now, there's a couple of different ways you can take that. There's a couple of different ways to be unbalanced. For instance, you can be kind of unbalanced in your emotions, in your emotional state. You can be unbalanced in your approach to, you know, finances. When we're talking about unbalanced, we're kind of limiting our conversation to the idea of spirituality. The world is an unbalanced place when it comes to spiritual matters. And I'm telling you, you can see this demonstrated everywhere. Today, after morning services, about oh, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, Josh and I went to get Josh's hair cut. And he sat down in the chair, and there was a young boy sitting across from him, and there were the two people cutting each one of you know, their heads of hair. And then there was the father of the other young man sitting there, along with two other women who were sitting, waiting. And we, become, we became kind of the audience, me and these two other ladies, to this conversation that took place between the two hairstylists and the father of the other young men. And it revolved around the idea of religion and whether or not people should be judgmental. And how folks who are typically religious are very judgmental. And how the world could do without all of the judgmentalism. And the conversation just went on and on and on. And we talked about homosexuality. And we talked about Bruce Jenner or former Bruce Jenner. And we talked about this and that and the other thing. And it just went on and on. And the more they talked, the more I realized these people have no idea what they're talking about. They have not a clue what it even means to be spiritual. Because in their mind, spirituality is equal to judgmentalism. That was the whole premise. If you are a person who claims to be Christian, then you are, in their minds, inherently judgmental. And when we say judgmental, what we really mean is condemning. Condemning. And so they went on and on and on and had their conversation and as I left and I handed the guy my card, I, or my credit card, I just slipped a couple business cards there as well and told him, if you have any questions about any of that, feel free to give me a call. But it was a pointless conversation that was absolutely out of balance. That's the world we live in. This morning we talked about being balanced as a person, but how do you continue to be balanced in a world that is so out of balance that it's hard to even recognize a genuine sense of what it means to be spiritual. I mean, the world is just amazingly confused when it comes to spirituality. What does it mean to be spiritual? Ask the average person on the street, and you're going to get that same unhinged, unbalanced, kind of oddball answer that is going to differ between every single person you ask. So how does the person who is a child of God, who is living a life grounded in his word, not just an understanding of it, but a practice of that word, constantly seeks God's people, is not on the fringe, not the outlier radical extreme like we talked about this morning, how does that person maintain that sense of spirituality and that sense of being balanced in a world that is so desperately unbalanced? Well, I think in part, the psalmist deals with this in Psalm 119. It kind of makes sense, doesn't it? Psalm 119 is primarily about what? What's it primarily about? It's about the Word, right? Psalm 119 is one of those sections of the Bible. <clears throat> longest chapter in the Bible? Longest chapter in the Bible that's main subject matter is the Bible, which makes sense. It tells us all about what it does for us how it lifts us up, how we're encouraged by it, what we should do with it, and so on and so forth. And if you begin reading at verse 49, 
49, the psalmist says this, and we're just going to read it all, and then I'm going to go back and draw out a few points that will help us know how to maintain our balance in an unbalanced world. Remember your word to your servant in which you have made me hope. This is my comfort in my affliction, that your promise gives me life. The insolent utterly deride me, but I do not turn away from your law. When I think of your rules from of old, I take comfort, O Lord. Hot indignation seizes me because of the wicked who forsake your law. Your statutes have been my song in the house of my sojourning. I remember your name in the night, O Lord, and keep your law. This blessing has fallen to me that I have kept your precepts. Now, there's a lot there, and there's a lot of different directions we could take this, and a lot of different encouragements that we can draw out of this. But bearing in mind that the author here is talking about himself versus those things that are in the world, we're going to use it to draw out these points about maintaining our balance when it comes to spiritual matters. Though the world may draw us away, And though many things tempt us, and many directions try to consume us, we can indeed maintain that balance. But the first thing we're going to need is courage. Now we read through the whole thing and you didn't find the word courage there, did you? No, but in the very first verse, it says this, Remember your word to your servant in which you have made me hope. You know what that word hope means? You know what the word hope means? Hope, hope is, is a word in the Bible that typically means, though there is some variation in the words that are used, typically means this confidence in our expectation for the future. There's a confidence there. Well, where does that confidence come from? You ever, you ever notice in the Bible that sometimes we, we have these passages that couple certain ideas together? Anytime you see that kind of arrangement over and over and over, you better pay attention because these things are typically linked to one another. Uh, For instance, one of them is fasting and prayer, fasting and prayer, fasting and prayer. Those two are together all the time, all the time. Well, there are three words that typically you find linked together or at least the pair of the two of these words. And they are faith, and you can guess the other two, can't you? Hope and love. Those are the three main ideas of what it means to be a follower of God. Now, where does hope come from? Why do we have a confident expectation? Well, we have that because of faith. And what is faith? Well, faith is this strength of conviction. You see, you can't have hope without having faith. Now, you can have the hope that the world offers, because when the world talks about hope, it's something kind of like this. Well, I hope I get a yacht for my birthday. You know, well, I mean, I don't want a yacht, but I mean, you know, it seems like a lot of barnacle scraping to me. But I mean, you know, when they say hope, they mean I wish for something or I long to have something. That's not the hope of the Bible. Hope in the Bible is this confident expectation that's built upon faith, but it's not just faith as a a knowledge set, as if they're just points of data along some stream of data that we just simply have to know and understand and interpret. You see, when the Bible talks about faith and belief, it talks about it as, as if it's a conviction that is so deep within us that we can't help but act. And folks, that's courage. Go back into the Old Testament. And you, <laughs> you go back to that time where Joshua and them are about ready to enter the land. God says it to them. I don't know. I mean, I can't remember how many times. But in the span of like three or four verses, he says it like four or five times. Anybody remember? Be what? Be strong and courageous. That's usually preceded by do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Be strong and courageous. Now, how strong and courageous are they going to be if they have no conviction about it? If I don't believe God is going to deliver me by marching around the walls of a city, I don't believe that God is going to deliver me by putting some lamps under pitchers and breaking them at the right moment. 
But I don't believe that God's going to split that sea in half when I raise that staff. What's the likelihood that I'm going to last long enough in that trial, in this unbalanced world, to see God's work fulfilled in me? Not very good, is it? Courage is not going to last very long. See, you, you and I, we, we don't serve a God that expects us to have this sort of nebulous idea of faith or this kind of empty, sort of grasping at smoke version of hope. This morning we said we have to be grounded in the Word. And hopefully when we understand that that grounding is there, it's the fire, the fuel, the flame of the courage that rises within us. Now, the world waters down the idea of courage a lot, doesn't it? It certainly does. Not to bring it up more than once in the same sermon, but there are certain things that just kind of really jerk my chain. You probably have your things. It's the reason why I can't watch most things biblical on TV, because they typically get most of it wrong. Well, not most of it. I mean, there's a lot of good stuff there, but I mean, they get things wrong and it just kind of irks me. But not long ago, I'm told, I don't watch the SB Awards, but did you hear that Bruce, what's his name, Caitlin now, Jenner, got the Arthur Ashe Award for Courage for coming out as a woman now instead of a man? Well, whatever you think of that, whatever you want to call that, it's up to you. But I'm telling you what, that's very far from my definition of courage. Very, very far. You know, you make a lifestyle choice. I mean, hey, I started smoking yesterday. Give me a courage award. I made a change in my lifestyle. Why is that any more or less? It doesn't make any sense to me. The world is off kilter when it comes to the notion of courage. Courage is strength given to us, rightfully so, for standing upon the right and moral principles of God. Courage is facing those things that cause us fear and yet moving forward anyhow to do that which is right. Well, we don't have to jump from airplanes and fight great wars to be courageous. We just have to be people who are bent on doing right and good in the eyes of God. Every single day, in every single decision, in the words that come out of our mouth, in the example that we set for people, we have to be people of courage. We have to be people who have the strength and the resolve enough of our faith to simply say, look, I'm not going along with what the world says. We have to be courageous. Kind of reminds me of the story of the you know, guy who was receiving the award on that cruise ship. Everyone on the cruise ship had gathered and they were giving him this award apparently Sometime at the beginning of the cruise, a young lady fell into the water. Seconds later, he jumps over the rail, swims out to her, keeps her from drowning until help can come. Everybody on the boat agreed, we need to do something for this guy. So they come up with this award. They call the corporate people. The corporate people fly things out to him and go through the big, grandiose kind of minutia of having this awards ceremony. And they present the award to the gentleman, and finally, the crowd starts doing that thing they always do, speech, speech. And the guy steps up to the microphone, and the only thing that he can say is, all right, I want to know who pushed me over. Courage isn't something that simply happens to us. Courage is something that we choose every single day. It's not something that we accidentally find ourselves in. But it's a choice that we make every day. Number two, the psalmist says that not only do we have to be courageous, but we have to realize that because we live in an unbalanced world, that there is going to be conflict. Sometimes we act as if we're surprised that, oh, the world doesn't like us because we stood for truth. 
Oh, that person didn't really like my opinion when I shared with them what the Scripture says about X, Y, and Z. Why is that a mystery to us? I mean, Christ had to emphasize this to his disciples, too. He told them, look, don't be surprised when the world hates you. Don't be surprised when they, you know, pick up the sticks and the stones and the, and, and the rocks and the, their crosses to come and crucify you. And you remember why he told them that? He said, look, they crucified me. Why would you expect them to do any less than you? I'm the master and you are the student. If they're, going to, if they're so bold as to crucify the master, do you think they're going to have any trouble with the student? See, when we live lives of balance in an unbalanced world, you have to realize there's going to be conflict. Notice what the psalmist says. This is my comfort and my affliction, for your promise gives me life. Speaking of the previous point. The insolent utterly deride me, but I do not turn away from your law. Conflict is going to come. Arrogant people attacking Christians, ridiculing them and mocking them, and that's really nothing new. We find that in just about every generation. It seems like it waxes and wanes, does it not? I mean, it wasn't but a couple weeks ago that I read some comments by well, a couple of different you know, scholars, uh, one of which is the, the now well-known you know, atheist Richard Dawkins, who you know, had to defend some of his comments about Christians, about faith, uh, and whether or not uh, we should call people who believe in the Bible and in the young earth uh, idiots. Have you read any of that conversation? Here's a guy who has no problem with belittling and mocking and putting down those of faith, when it takes far more faith, so to speak, if faith is a leap in the dark, to believe the nonsense that he spews. But he has no problem mocking. And he has no problem calling Christians idiots. And that's the world we live in. Then there were other comments by, I can't remember the fellow's name, he was asked the question uh, in an interview. What if, and what would you say, in the face of a God, that if you died today, you found out that everything Christians believed was true? His comments are very, very interesting. He basically said, well, I would refuse to go into any kind of heaven that was led by a God of that nature because of little children getting cancer. How can, you know, and then gives, so it goes on and becomes very, very mocking of those who believe in Christ. See, that's, the, again, the world we live in. Paul would write about it in 2 Timothy chapter 3. Chapter 3 and verse 12, Timothy, or Paul writes to Timothy, he says, All that will live godly lives in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. See, with Paul, there's a very clear line of distinction. He says, look, if you're living a godly life, if you're letting your light shine, to borrow Jesus' language, if you're being salt in this world, then you are going to be persecuted. That's just simply the way it is. Because that's the way the world is. Now, he also says, look, the insolent deride me, but I do not turn away from your law. Why? Well, because it's the law that holds us there. If we're going to keep our balance, we may not be able to depend upon people around us helping us out. But we can depend upon God's word. We can depend upon the things that Christ said. God is our strength, our power. It's like that old song says, it's no secret what God can do. What he's done for others, he will do for you. With arms open wide, he'll carry you. It's no secret what God can do. You see, when we lean upon him and we lean upon his word, then in the conflict, God helps us. Jeremiah, in Jeremiah chapter 33 and verse 3, he, he says this. He says, call on me, speaking the words of God here. 
and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. If we call upon God and we lean upon his word, then we can have that, knowing that there's conflict. Knowing that the conflict will come, but leaning upon him. Number three, if we are going to maintain our balance, we must, <clears throat> we must be, or we must have a consternation when it comes to the world itself in many ways. Now, maybe that's a word you're not familiar with. I wanted them all to start with C, right? Courage, conflict, consternation. Consternation is just a word that means a horrified shock. A horrified shock. Have you ever gotten the impression that lately people are just simply unaffected by anything? You know, we keep having to up the annies, up the, up the ante, <laughs> up the ante and just about everything across the board. I mean, you show folks this, isn't this horrible? Eh, I saw that. Eh, I know that. Ah, yeah. Seems like nothing startles anybody. Seems like nothing amazes, you know, anybody. Days and weeks and months go by, and story after story after story about horrible and horrendous things that are obviously contrary to God's word. Great wickedness going on all around us, and we just kind of mull about like everything's usual. You see, when God gives us his word and he tells us, you've got to stand upon this word, then part of that means that there are things that we are going to look at because we are sensitized by his word, and we are going to find ourselves righteously indignant. You see, in 1 John chapter 5, yeah, 1 John chapter 5, verse 19, John, of course, the, the apostle whom Jesus loved, wrote about the world, and he said that the world lies in wickedness. And what he means there is kind of the same thing when we talk about, you know, he was lying in the mud or they were lying in the bed. In other words, it has rested in that state, in that position. And it kind of dwells there and abides there. The world dwells, lies in wickedness. And yet people remain unaffected. I'll give you just a few statistics here. One out of four human beings in the United States of America will, it is predicted, this year, if statistics prove the same as last year, be a victim of crime. Some crime. Whether it's identity theft, whether you're mugged on the street, whether somebody steals your wallet or, or hacks your bank account. One out of four of us will be affected by some crime this year. You watch television and there are at least 10 to 15 times more sex scenes, scenes of violence, profanity than any wholesome and clean and family-oriented images that you'll find on television in your average primetime slot. Pornography, some say, <clears throat> brings in over about $10 billion a year. $10 billion a year. Now granted, it's not exactly the thriving company it used to be, but that's about twice as much money as the Sears and Roebuck company profited worldwide last year. $10 billion in our country alone, pornography. Sears and Roebuck did half of that worldwide last year. 38% of female children will be abused sexually by the time they are 13 years of age. A child is abused, uh, a child is abused every two minutes in the United States. What makes it more horrendous is that one case is reported, for every one case that is reported, I should say, there are nine that aren't. It's estimated. And this is the world that we live in. And there should be in and among us a sense that something is just simply horribly wrong. Horribly wrong. There ought to be an indignation, a consternation within us. There's an old saying, 
It's a saying that I'm borrowing, and it's a saying that lots of people, no doubt, have borrowed. Doing what's right is not always popular, and doing what is popular is not always right. You're going to find yourself outside of popularity when you go against some of these things. And yet, that's what the Christian is called to do. I can't take it as a light matter that young women in droves are put in shipping crates and sold to the highest bidder. I mean, how many restaurants in our own area within the last five years have been busted for that type of thing? It's horrible. Number four, despite all of the horrible nature of all of the things that happen around us, despite the derision and the conflict that will come, Despite the, as verse 53 says, the hot indignation that seizes me because of the wickedness and the forsaking of your law, there is a consolation. If you go to the next verse, go to the next verse. He says, your statutes have been my song in the house of my sojourning. I remember your name in the night, O Lord, and keep your law. See, where there is this indignation where there is this conflict god sends help for us power to us the first five verses are spent struggling but then the psalmist seems to rejoice here your statutes have been my song in the house of my pilgrimage one version says it kind of reminds me of some of what we're taught in some of the songs that we sing you remember that song that says, There's within my heart a melody? Remember that one? There's within my heart a melody. Jesus whispers sweet and low, Fear not, I am with thee, peace be still. In all of life's ebb and flow, Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. There's another song that talks about, He gave me a song, a wonderful song. A wonderful song I now can sing, right? See, the psalmist feels that same way. Despite all of the conflict and despite all of these things happening and despite the unbalance in the world, God gives you a song. He tells you you should be joyful. And of course, you've got to wonder what's behind all of that. No doubt that's a whole lesson series on its own, but I can't help but think that it has simply to do with he saves us. And the reality of life is very simply this. I need saving. And my God will do that for me. And he will lift me up and empower me to overcome no matter what is there. So he sends me that song. But then he tells me too. That he must meditate or I must meditate on his word. I remember your name in the night, O Lord, and keep your statutes. How can you stay balanced in this world? You can sing that song that God places within your heart and you can meditate continually upon his word. Now, you know what that means, right? I mean, you know what meditation is. It's not, you know, you making random noises as you sit cross leg on the floor. Though that does benefit you stretching wise, I found out. You know. That's not what it is. You see, when we meditate on God's word, it's more of a problem-solving exercise, if you want to think of it in those terms. You see, I live a life, and that life is lived amongst unbalanced people, and that's going to cause a lot of these conflicts, and it's going to cause me to have lots of questions, and where do I find answers? We see, the Word tells me that I'm supposed to come to the Word to find those answers, but sometimes they're just not clear. Okay, God, I see what you're saying here, but how do I put that to use over here? You see, that's why I sit in those night watches. And that's why in the midst of the night, some of the psalmists say, I arise and sit on my bed and I think about those commands you've given me. How can I put that to use? How can that play out in my life? See, that's what meditation is. It's not study. It's not reading. It's that kind of part that's sort of in between the practical application, the actual action, and the study itself. How do I get those two together? 
there is a consolation of God. And yet all of this hinges upon the last point that we can make. We must be compliant. Or, if you want to put it another way, obedient. I remember your name in the night, O Lord, and keep your law. This blessing has fallen on me that I have kept your precepts. When we keep the law of God, when we stick to that firm foundation, then we're going to have the balance that comes from it. You know, the world can shift its thinking, and the world can change its trends and its ways and move its attitudes and its nature from this position to that position to this position to that position. You ever notice how that works? You know, one minute this is in and that is out and this is in and that's back in and this is from a long time ago, but now it's come back. And I'm not just talking about fashion. I'm talking about the rightness and wrongness of things. It waxes and wanes. The child of God realizes that God's word never changes. Jesus Christ, the same what? Yesterday, today, and forever. So tomorrow, he's not going to change. All of a sudden, tomorrow, it's, well, you know what? You don't have to go do that church thing anymore. Yeah, that whole singing thing and prayer, forget all that. We, we don't need that anymore. Yeah, they're obeying my commands and being a good person. It's okay to shake it loose every once in a while and, you know, really, whatever. He's the same today as he was yesterday, as he will be tomorrow. There's not only consolation, but I have to be compliant. So do we have that balance in an unbalanced world? Do we seek to live within the framework of God's design for us? Well, hopefully we do. And, and hopefully we've been very successful uh, at that. And hopefully our zeal just continues to grow and grow and grow as we continue to mature and mature and mature. But if you're here tonight and you're subject to the invitation's call, we're going to urge you to come here in just a minute, but I want to tell you what that means. First of all, you are always invited to become a child of God. And the, the way in which you do that is, well, described in the scripture. And it's something that all of us can know and understand and follow with relative ease. It's the beginning of the journey of the child of God. We hear his word. Somewhere along the way, we pick it up, we read it, we come to understand that, you know, it talks about things like sin. And it talks about what I have to do to have a right relationship with God. And somewhere along the way... <clears throat> I am convicted by the things that I read there. My heart is pricked. That's how it's put in Acts chapter 2. My heart is pricked. I believe. Based upon that belief, then I want to do something about my sin, so I repent. And that's that change of mind part that we often talk about that is necessary. Luke chapter 13, verse 3, repent, or you will likewise perish. But it doesn't stop there. We've got to confess the name of Christ with the mouth. Confession is made unto salvation, Paul would say in the book of Romans in chapter 10. And then based upon that confession, we go into the waters of baptism. See, and there's the culmination of those things. It's that point at which we submit. Every time baptism is mentioned in the scripture, it's passive. It's not something you do. It's something that's done to you. You're saying, God, take all of me. And he plunges you in that water and you are washed clean of your sin and you rise to walk in newness of life. That's where your journey begins. And a journey it is. Sometimes we stay on the path, sometimes we stray, we need lots of help. None of us make it alone. And there are times of great strength and there are times of great weakness. And maybe it's a time of weakness for you. Or maybe it's a time in which you just want to be stronger and need prayers. If you're here tonight, and any of that rings true for you, if you have some request that you would like to make known, do so as together we stand and sing.